If you've played a popular RPG like Pathfinder or Tales of the Valiant or anything with a direct D&D lineage, then you know that there are at least two modes of the game. First, there's the role-playing mode. When you're role-playing, you pretend to talk to non-player characters, usually played by the games master, and you make choices about where your characters go are going to go next and how to find adventure. And then there's combat mode. During combat, you put your miniature on a battle map, maybe literally, like in, on a table in front of you, maybe on a computer, or maybe just in your imagination, and you plan out every single move you make in 30 foot or 20 foot increments depending on your size, making attacks against your foe's armor class while trying to avoid being hit in retribution. For some players, both modes are equally enjoyable. For some players, combat is the best part of game night, uh, but for other players, it's tedious micromanagement that would much better be solved by, like, a coin toss, or anything but the hour or two hours that it takes to get through combat. If you are one of the people who loves combat as much as as or more than the role playing then you might also be a wargamer, whether you realize it or not. Wargaming, like an RPG, is surprisingly flexible, and many wargamers find that narrative play provides the same satisfaction as a story-driven role-playing game. I'm not here to convince anyone to stop playing role-playing games, because I play a weekly role-playing game myself. I'm quite fond of them. But I am hoping to introduce you to wargaming if you've never played one. Buying a war game is similar to buying an RPG. You basically buy just a book, the rule book, and you read it through, you learn the rules, and because a war game is essentially just the combat part of an RPG, I mean, actually it was the other way around for, for historical accuracy, role-playing games were born of war games, war games aren't the combat part of RPG, RPG is a war game with a bunch of other stuff stacked on top of it. But anyway, the rule book for a war game is focused mostly on what happens on on the battlefield, but there are two major differences. First, instead of controlling one character, like you do in an RPG, you control a whole army, and that army might just be six little people, or it might be 60 people. Uh, and secondly, because the entire game is just the combat, your combat actions are more detailed than they are in most role-playing games. Armies, not characters. Playing an army means you have to build, both literally and figuratively, an army instead of a character. But it also means that you have to think about the character of your army. I'll explain that in a moment. To summon your power for the conflict to come, you must first have power over that which conflicts you. When you build an army for a war game, you're deciding what kinds of military units you want to control on the battlefield. This starts with deciding on the size of your army. Do you want to control, for instance, 64 miniatures or 16 or 8? Unit size differs from game system to game system, but if you're used to controlling just the one miniature from your RP, PG, then probably 5 or 8 or 10 sounds pretty overwhelming, but in practice, your army moves probably in troops or units. You might be literally moving 64 miniatures across your table, but you're really only advancing like 8 groups of 8 for instance. Each troop member is, I mean, sometimes glued onto the same square base or else played, like, placed in a, a movement tray or whatever so that they all stay in formation or they maintain unit cohesion. Once you know your target army size, you have to choose what kinds of soldiers, infantry, cavalry, melee, ranged, and war gear, like turrets and battering rams and catapults and so on, you want to include in your army. Your war game rulebook usually specifies the options you have. There are rules governing how many of each thing you can add to your army roster so that you don't bring, like, ten ballistas to fight your opponent's uh, five unarmored duelists. Some game systems use a point-by system with low-level troops costing a few points and really powerful ones costing a lot of points. Other game systems will just limit weapon types by count. You can have this number of melee weapons and that number of ranged, and so on. Building an army roster is usually done on paper or in an app these days, so you're sure to get the right mix of troops. After you've finalized your roster, you go out to your friendly local gaming store and buy the miniatures you need. Some rulebooks are written for specific miniatures like Games Workshop, Warhammer, Corvus Belly, Mantic Games. Others are generic and allow for interpretation. There are advantages and disadvantages to each approach, 
but this is a tabletop game, so there's as much flexibility as you're willing to tolerate. Technically, you don't need miniatures at all. The game rules work with paper cutouts just as well as they do with a bag of dollar store plastic green toy soldiers or a $50 kit of detailed wargaming miniatures. It's entirely up to you. The physical component of army building is so significant that it's its own cottage industry. Wargamers tend to be invested in assembling and painting the models representing their troops. It's a guarded and intentional uh, defense efficiency of manufacturing. Miniatures for war games are delivered unassembled, so you can choose which head to put on which body or which weapon, more importantly, to assign to which figure. They're also delivered unpainted, so you can devise your own color scheme for your troops, which isn't just a vanity project because it helps distinguish your troops from your opponent's troops during the game. There are people who enjoy this aspect of army building so much that they don't even play war games. They just build and paint miniatures. Back when I was just an RPG player, I never used to paint miniatures because I thought it was well beyond my skills, but I've been pleasantly surprised as a wargamer that thanks to contrast paints and really, really amazing sculpts, army building has become one of my favorite aspects of tabletop gaming. If you're one of those RPG players who sits around building characters that you'll never play or sketching out dungeons, half of which you'll never run, then you can think of army building and miniature painting as part of the same ethos. And that's what I meant by you have to think about the character of your army. Wargaming, like an RPG, doesn't stop after the table gets cleared off and goes back to being just a dining room table again. You can obsess over your armies just as much as you do over your RPG character build, both by theory crafting army rosters that you may never play, and by physically assembling and painting models, which hopefully you will play. After you've got your army assembled, it's time to play the game, regardless of which war game you've chosen to play. The rule book tells you how the game is played. I think of a war game in two parts. There's the setup and there's the combat. Unlike an RPG, RPG, there's no games master in, in most war games. It's just you and an opponent and the rules. The games master is the scenario itself. A scenario, whether it's called a scenario or a mission or a quest, is the reason your armies are fighting, and it usually involves some kind of special objective for that particular battle. It can be something vague like kill the enemy, or more often it can be something strategic to a larger war, like secure hill 242, or retrieve an important data drop, or go blow up a bridge, and so on. And you usually score extra points for securing that objective, whatever the objective might be. The combat itself encompasses what you do during your turn. Because a war game is just combat, the process for fighting in a war game is typically more detailed than fighting in an RPG. In an RPG, you usually have four to six other players, each needing a turn, plus the game master, so combat is often designed to be relatively quick. I'm not actually claiming that RPG combat systems are all that fast, but I mean, there is usually room for a little bit of roleplay before and after the, the fight. Once the fighting stops in a war game, though, the game is over, aside from possibly some recovery roles, and general army maintenance. O or is it really over? W we'll come back to that later. When moving miniatures in a war game, you don't usually count squares the way you do in an RPG. The scope of w mini war games is meant to be epic. You've got lots of troops covering lots of ground, so war games measure movement usually in inches, using a ruler or a tape measure because it's usually presumed that you're playing on a very large table with no built-in grid. Movement in a war game is often split into different types of movement. You might have a normal move, a charge action, a pile in or melee movement, stealth movement, so on. There's often terrain features on the table too that you have to move around. There could be traps and atmospheric effects that impose new rules or saving throws. Attacking in a war game rarely targets an armor class and instead offers essentially a saving throw. You roll to attack your opponent and your opponent probably rolls to see which hit actually deals damage. You're usually rolling a lot of dice too because you have a lot of miniatures on the table. Attacks are often divided into different kinds of attacks using different skills and accordingly different dice. Your pool of health points for a unit in a war game is typically a lot smaller than what you have for an RPG character. It's not uncommon to see a tolerance for just two or three wounds for each miniature in a war game, sometimes less. One good hit in a war game can mean death for a miniature, and when a unit loses too many miniatures, the soldiers remaining may break rank and flee, pending a morale test. Most of these concepts are probably roughly familiar to an RPG player, but usually each one involves 
themselves, say, two steps instead of one, seven or ten or fifteen dice instead of a single d20, and so on. It depends on the game, but generally everything's a little more complex. You might think it's to pad out the gameplay, but actually it's to help simulate the variables involved in a full-scale war. Trying to play a war game using RPG combat rules would become frustrating pretty quickly. The abstraction of, for instance, an armor class and the high numbers involved with individual HP just doesn't translate to a big battle. So you deal with the details of your army, including weaponry and endurance, movement, morale, coordination, and of course, strategy. Narrative and campaigns. While wargaming doesn't involve roleplay as such, that doesn't mean it lacks narrative. It can lack a narrative if you don't want one, and that is liberating. A, a war game really can just be a board game style experience where you set up your troops and battle it out with an opponent with no pretense of why these armies are fighting. However, it's equally as possible to structure a campaign of encounters held together by a story. And while you're thinking about what your army should do next, you are in a way roleplaying as an army general. You can narrate what a troop is doing as you move it across the board. You can rationalize its decisions. When your war machine, the one you thought couldn't be taken down, finally falls, you can tell the story of how and why the impossible has occurred. A creative player can generate a narrative around the game and from the game's mechanics as they happen. Some war games have entire books of campaigns with backstory and specific missions contained inside. Others, like historic war gaming, just use real life history as its narrative. And if you're the type of RPG player who loves coming up with backstories for your characters or designing dungeons and adventures for other players, then you can invent your own scenarios and objectives for your armies to play and those can feed into the next game that you play and so on. There's a lot of room for creativity in wargaming and just because you don't have a character sheet doesn't mean you're you're not telling engaging stories set in a fictional world. And when I said earlier, the game isn't really over at the end of a war game, that's true too, because you can take a look at your army and see how it has changed from the last battle, whether you won or lost. There have been losses, and you have to account for those. You have to figure out where to go from there. Again, it depends on your game system, but some games, some war games, have a system for campaigning, earning money, and then spending that money on hiring a mercenary to replace the soldier who fell in the last battle, or for upgrading and getting better equipment, or earning new abilities, or finding new spells if you have a magic user, or finding new technology if it's a sci-fi war game, and so on. You can continue playing your war game between actual games, just like you do with your RPG. If you're an RPG player and you love the tense strategy of combat, you should probably try a war game, just as a favor to yourself. You don't have to go out and invest in a collection of 100 miniatures. Just grab a handful of D&D &D miniatures that you're using anyway, or if you don't use those, grab a handful of cheap player tokens that you get from a dollar store in, or in another board game and use those. I highly recommend Snarling Badger over at snarlingbadger.com. Space Station Zero is a really fun one to start with, or Rain in Hell with the Oculus Spear expansion for solo play, and also breachstorm.com. There are rules for free there that you can check out and try before you buy. A bunch of the assets are print and play, so you don't really ever have to buy if you don't want to, although it's a really cool project, and so if you like it, you should invest in it. It's, it's, a, cool, it's a cool little game. Those are two easy places to start. Obviously, there are lots of others. Check them out if you're interested. Thanks for watching.